a tutorial on how to consolidate your federal student loans. If you have federal student loans you need to consolidate, uh, you want to do it through studentaid.gov. What you're going to do is go to loan repayment and then you're going to go ahead under prepare and apply, click on consolidate loans. When you are there, you're going to click on log in to apply. In order to consolidate your federal student loans, you're going to need to have access to your federal student aid account. This is your username and password that you use to apply for FAFSA. If it has been a while since you graduated, you would still need to have an account. You can reset your username and password if you forgot it, or you can create an account if you believe you've never created an account. But you will need to have an account in order to do the consolidation. For our purposes, I am not going to log in. I am just going to do a walkthrough through the demo provided here. So I'm going to go ahead and continue. And this is basically what you're going to be encountering uh, when you actually do the consolidation. So once you log in, it's going to provide some general information about the consolidation and the different steps you're going to take in order to complete it. So I'm just going to scroll down and click continue. So the first part is going to be about you and your contact information. You want to make sure that your first name, last name, and all your information is accurate. Pay attention to how you spell your name, if you have a middle initial, if you have a period, because at the end of the presentation, you're going to have to sign off on the application by typing your name. And if there's any discrepancy, even an extra space when you sign off at the end, then it won't allow you to move forward. Um, all this information should be auto-populated and uh, you should just be able to review it. Under the contact information, if there's an issue, you should be able to um, update it uh, where necessary. You will be required to check off this box that says, this is my current permanent address. And then you're also gonna be required to enter, if it's because it's not gonna be there, the best time to reach you. Um, typically, they're not going to contact you. Federal student aid is not going to contact you, but they do need this information. So you can select the block of time. Driver's license is actually optional, so you don't have to complete it. You will then continue. And so the second part is going to ask you uh, a little bit more information. If you're currently employed, you would check off that box and type in your employer information, including the zip code um, and and an address. Um, if you're not employed, you will leave that as is and then continue. At this point, you're going to select the loans you want to consolidate. So you want to pay close attention to this part because technically it's going to populate all the loans that you have um, that are federal student loans. It's not going to include private loans. So I, at this point, you want to make sure that you're consolidating the loans um, that you want to consolidate and that the total balance matches. Now, if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness, you do want to check off that box just to get general guidance and review that information. But again, in this section, you just want to make sure that the loans you want to consolidate are there. A lot of people ask about the interest rate and what happens when you consolidate. When you consolidate, you're going to get the weighted average interest rate of all the loans you have on file that you're consolidating, and it's bumped to a one eighth of a percentage point. In general, you wouldn't necessarily be consolidating to reduce your interest rate because that's not going to happen with federal student loans. Um, but the very small bump in interest, the one eighth of a percentage, is, is minor where, in general, the benefits of consolidation uh, offset any, any very small interest increase. Uh, when you consolidate, your interest is going to be fixed. And you can see here, for example, for this person, 50,000, an average of 4.1. They had uh, some loans at 5.1 and another loan at 3.4. So you just want to make sure, again, that all the loans you want consolidated have a check there. If you don't want to consolidate one for whatever reason, uh, then you would uncheck it. But for this purpose, we're checking both off and then we're going to continue. This next part is really important because if you're consolidating, chances are you don't want any delays in your consolidation, meaning you want the servicer to process your consolidation as soon as possible. So here, 
um, you would be able to select from the drop down menu menu and you would select do not delay processing that is very critical especially if you're trying to meet a specific deadline so again under processing delay you would select do not delay processing for the servicer to begin the consolidation process as soon as they get the, the application. Now, this is another important step where you're going to be selecting your student loan servicer. If you are pursuing the public service loan forgiveness program, you're going to answer yes to this question because um, you're going to have to consolidate and send your loans to Mohila. Mohila is the only student loan servicer managing the public service loan forgiveness program. And one way to get your loans to Mohila is by selecting them as your servicer when you consolidate. If you are not pursuing public service loan forgiveness, you can select no, and then you can select one of this um, for servicers, including Mohila. Um, you would then be able to select any of the servicers. Um, you can do a little bit of research on the ratings to figure out which one may be best if you don't have a preference. Um, they are all contracted by the federal government to manage federal student loans. So I'm going to select Nelnet for this purpose, no particular reason, and I'm just going to continue. Okay, this part is going to walk you through your repayment plan option. You have to select the repayment plan option and think about it as two buckets of options. The first one is uh, pay your loans based on your income, household income. And the second option or bucket of options is pay based on the total loan balance and um, the interest rate in a predetermined payback period. A lot of people are consolidated in part to take advantage of um, if they have to of the new repayment plan or just in general a lot of people are opting for an income driven repayment plan especially if they have a high loan balance so if you're going to opt for an income driven repayment plan which again that just means that the repayment plan is based on your income you would select that and then you would fill out um, or continue actually you would scroll down through all these disclosures which you should read and then you would uh, authorize the federal government to do some data matching uh, for you. It will also ask you whether you're married and this is important. If you're married, it's then going to ask you whether you're separated and if you say no, uh, which you should be saying the status that you are in, um, it will ask you whether you can access your spouse's financial, um, financial information like incomes and then it will ask you if you file jointly. Now, a lot of people get worried and wonder, why are they asking me if my spouse doesn't have any student loans? The reason why they're asking you is because you're opting into an income-driven repayment plan, which is based on your household income. And despite your spouse not being liable for your student loans, it does impact your household, right? So um, they also want to verify that if you're filing jointly, they can retrieve that information. So if you say that you are filing jointly, you live together and all that good stuff, it will ask you for your spouse's first name, last name, date of birth, and social security number. The reason why they're asking for this information, which is very specific, is because again, they need to do data match with the IRS to determine your household income and be able to provide you with that information. Um, if you are not married, then you would just answer the questions accordingly. And then you would also get to this point where um, it will do data match. If they were successful at doing the data match, you will be able to continue. It's going to ask you about your family size and whether it's going to change in the next 12 months. Usually this is referencing to the possibility of someone um, adding a new family member to their household. So if we say no, then we'll be able to just continue. Again, it's just going through the process and, and uploading data matching um, your information. Then it's going to confirm the number of dependents you have. If you have children, you would put it in here. If you have other dependents, like you take care and, and of your mom and they live with you and you provide half of the support, you would be able to put them in here. Now, if your kids... Um, are still dependent on you, you're still providing support and all that, you would still be able to put them here. You do not need to claim them in your taxes to be able to include them for purposes of your student loans and your repayment. So you would go ahead and do that. Um, 
It's going to ask you whether you filed taxes in the last two years. For most people, it's going to be yes. And it's going to ask you whether your income has significantly decreased. For, more, for most borrowers, I should say, the answer is no, so you would do that. If you say yes, that it has, it's going to ask you for proof of income because it's not going to be able to use the tax filing data on record to validate your income. Um, so for the most part, unless the income has significantly decreased for clients, I usually just, um, we say no for now to allow the consolidation to go through. And in the future, at any point, the client can update their income to properly reflect their income. Um, it's going to ask whether the person had, um, the spouse had any taxable income. Again, you're not going to get these questions if you're not married. Um, so it's asking whether you and your spouse have taxable income, and then you would just go ahead and provide that information. Then, um, again, if you haven't filed taxes or they are not able to data match, you will be asked to provide proof of income, and you would be able to upload that proof of income here. Uh, once you do that, you would continue. And then here's where you would estimate your, your payment based on your income. So I'm going to say $100,000 as estimated income. Um, we'll leave that as $50,000. The spouse has no um, loans. And so there it will show me the, the income-driven repayment plans. So here it is showing us the save is, is, is the lowest repayment plan. Uh, usually you would be able to select that and move forward. So we're just going to continue. It's going to ask you for two references. A lot of people already have references on file, so you would just check off the two boxes as the references you want. If you don't have any references, you would need to add them. These are not moral character references. These are just two people that do not live with you, that know you. Uh, in the event, let's say you default on your loans, they may be contacted but otherwise they're not going to be con contacted by uh, federal student aid or the Department of Education. It will ask you very specific information, including relationship to you and all that good stuff. So you would add two references, then check off the two references, and then continue. The next part is terms and conditions, so it's a lot of boilerplate. You will get a copy at the end, or you'll be able to access a copy of the application uh, at the end in case you want to read through all this. So we would continue. And again, more terms and conditions. So we just scroll down for purposes of this demo. And we continue with a little bit more disclosures. We're almost done. And we continue. Again, these are all disclosures. You will have access to the completed application with all this information. At the end, you're going to have to agree that you understand the terms and conditions and responsibilities with this consolidation and the loans. And it's going to give you the review and submit option here. So it's going to summarize everything that you've completed in the application. You want to pay attention to everything because it's important, but you want to make sure that you double check to make sure that the loans you want to consolidate are included and you want to make sure that if you were pursuing public service loan forgiveness, for example, that Mojila was selected. Otherwise, here you will see the servicer um, and all the completed information. It's If you are married, uh, it will also list all that information, family size, literally all the information we just went through, it's going to be there and then you would continue. And at this point, you would um, provide an electronic signature. Remember at the beginning, I said you must make sure that you see how your name, if you have an initial and last name, are um, spelled out on your application because you have to type it in exactly. You cannot even go over an extra space. And at that point, you would um, submit the application and you would be able to um, usually click on a link that it's going to take you to the completed application. Now. Once you complete the application, if you're logged in into your account, you're going to go to the right-hand corner and you're going to see your name and you're going to go to your dashboard. On your dashboard, you're going to scroll down to recent activity and you're going to get a copy of that application and it's going to show that it has been submitted. Um, I want to quickly go back and redo this just to show you 
the simplified version if you are not um, married. So again, we're just scrolling really quick through here just to show you if you're not married, you're just going to provide, review all that good information, continue. Um, you can feed that section. You make sure that you are selecting the loans you want to consolidate. You select do not delay processing. I'm going to select no. Uh, mail it. Continue. Um, and here, the other part that I didn't show you, if you wanted to just apply for a standard repayment plan or what I would call a traditional plan that is not based on your income, you would be able to select that and continue. Um, for that, you'll see that you don't have to provide more income information. There won't be IRS data matching. Now, remember, if you opt for one of these traditional plans that are not based on your income, these do not have any forgiveness attached. So you want to be aware of that. Uh, for this purpose, I'm just going to, again, select the first one. Um, you would add the two references. And it's going to take us right through um, the terms and conditions, again, because we did not um, provide information that we were married. So if you're not married, it's going to be a more simple application because it's going to skip through a lot of questions, including all the income information questions. Um, I should say, even if you're married, if you opt for a traditional plan and not a plan based on your income, it's going to bypass a lot of those questions. Again, if you want some type of forgiveness program, you usually have to be enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan versus a traditional plan. So you would be going through this option versus this um, other option. And that's it. Again, you will get a copy of this completed and submitted application on your dashboard when you log in. You will go through the right-hand corner, click on your name, and scroll down to activities. I hope this was useful. Highly recommend you go through the demo first. If you have any concerns or questions, you will be able to save the application in case you don't complete it at the same time that you started it.